investor in the microfinance uh, uh, business network here. Uh, one is basically how, what our experience was like before October 2019. And the other is post October 2019. And they've been quite different experiences. So before, and I'll make this fairly quick because we're not back in that era now. I mean, it's for the foreseeable future, there's gonna be more difficult times ahead of us. But before October 2019, our principal concerns here were inclusivity. And we worked through the microfinance institutions to hope to achieve that. And for the viewers out there, inclusivity may be an empty word to them, but it has a great deal of significance to this country. This country perhaps more than any other country that I've worked in. And it basically means that a lot of the citizens here in Lebanon that are outside the economic systems of this country are able to be brought in to the economic systems here. And by doing that, to give them a sense of ownership over the economy of this country. And to join with those regions and those demographics here that are already in those systems, and to join them so there's not a feeling of exclusion by those citizens who are not in the system. And those, those citizens that we talk about are for the most part, you, you all know them very well. They're the family shop, up to 160,000 of them throughout this country, that where you buy your grocers, where you get groceries, where you get your shoes fixed, where you buy your medicines from, it's those folks <clears throat> that are our principal clients here. So that basically, that's the group, they are not part of the banking, the formal retail commercial banks in this country, because quite frankly, the banks do not believe that the transaction costs of bringing these folks into the retail banking system warrant an effort to go after these particular shops across this country. That's where the microfinance uh, businesses, institutes, etc., played their particular role. They took these small shopholders that did not have collateral, that to a large extent were not in the government data banks, and they made them basically customers. I shouldn't say made them, they invited them to become customers and based on very good, totally good performance, that means making all their monthly payments, they became trusted clients of the microfinance community here. That was before October, and when you look back, back on it, the progress was really significant. The MFIs, and I'm, when I say MFIs, I'm normally talking about the eight members of the Lebanese Microfinance Association here, and <clears throat> that are basically coordinated uh, by Dr. Yusuf Halil and Ola Hariri. And those, the, that group of eight showed at least each year 10% growth in the number of shop owners, micro businesses, and small businesses that benefited from getting affordable, and that's a key word, affordable loans so that they could expand their businesses, basically start to 
feel encouraged that the dreams that they had for their shops could be fulfilled, could be satisfied. And through that, that they would be able to pay those bills for their children's education, their family's health care. Then we had October 17, 2019. And just about everything I said before changed dramatically, significantly. And we all know about the crisis. That doesn't have to be explained and it's not getting any better. In fact, it's getting worse. So that basically at that particular time, with the encouragement of the mission director of the United States Agency for International Development, asked us as a primary investor for USAID in these microfinance institutes, asked us if we could pivot, if we could change our approach to meet the impending financial crisis before us, and we did. And we did through that same group the Lebanese Microfinance Association, the MFIs as we call them. And we did it by offering low cost or no cost loans and grace periods so that they could continue to keep those shops, those 150, 60,000 shops from closing their doors and going out of business. And not just going out of business, the pain that that would cause their family, but the pain that that would cause the community, the pain that that would cause the future investments <clears throat> um, in their children, the pain that that would cause consumers paying higher prices. And the MFIs did this because you say basically provided the necessary largesse grants, dollar grants to these MFIs so that they could basically absorb their operating costs and give the opportunity for these small shops across the country to be able to get loans at little interest or no interest and grace periods of several months before there need be any payments. To a large extent, it's an unwritten story here in this country. It will be written when Lebanon gets through this crisis for sure. But there were thousands and thousands of small businesses who were able to stay open maintain their dignity and provide the services for their community that would not have been had there not been this alliance and this partnership between the Lebanese Microfinance Association, principally eight of the top MFIs in this country, and USAID. So we changed dramatically in some, we changed dramatically from the days before the liquidity crisis of October 2019. We pivoted at the urging of USAID and our own heartfelt sense that was what was needed to be able to provide emergency assistance to prevent the complete collapse of small shops across this country. Everywhere in this country, they are uh, active, the MFIs.